Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start our program for the evening. If you can be seated, please. Can we please have our seats? Thank you. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Hello. Good evening. My name is Amin Statia. I'm the gala chair. I'm a board member of the American Task Force on Palestine. Thank you. If we can have seats, please. Thank you. OK? OK. All right. Let's start our program for tonight. My name is Amin Statia. I'm the gala chair. I'm a board member of the American Task Force on Palestine. On behalf of our board, I welcome you to our fifth annual gala, Building Palestine, the Indispensable State for Peace. Our MC for tonight is Mr. Hisham Milham, the Bureau Chief of Al Arabiya. Mr. Hussein Ibish, our, MC, our supposed MC, couldn't make it tonight. However, Mr. Milham was grateful enough and thankful. We are very thankful for him and appreciate that he, is, that he came on such short notice. Mr. Melhem, if you don't mind. Thank you, Amin. Good evening. My name is Hisham Melhem, and I'm not, usually don't MC events like this, or any events, but tonight uh, I was recruited by Ziad and Naila, and uh, there's always an exception, so here I am. Uh, if you wonder by my hand, I have a story, but I can't tell you. I don't, I don't think we have enough time. Uh, welcome to this fifth annual gala of the task, American Task Force on Palestine. This has become a tradition where every year, Palestinian Americans, Palestinians, and their friends get together to celebrate the achievements of American Palestinians in the fields of arts, science, medicine, literature, uh, you name it. Tonight, we will be celebrating in poetry, and we will be celebrating in prose, because we have Naomi Shehab Nye, an accomplished poet, and we have and we have Betty Shamir, who's uh, an accomplished playwright. Tonight also, we will celebrate public service. We will celebrate courage, military courage, because we are celebrating or honoring Peter Mansour, Colonel Peter Mansour. Finally, we are celebrating business acumen and business excellence, in, which is personified in our uh, uh, honoree, uh, Hassan Salami. <laughs> and of course, you will hear from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in a few minutes. Um,
They don't have the opportunity of listening to Hillary Clinton every night. Come on, folks. You know, people say um, these are, I mean, you can always say these are interesting times for the Palestinians, but in their long struggle for statehood, for freedom, for independence, Palestinians have always lived through interesting, albeit painful times. And tonight we are celebrating the achievements of these four Palestinian Americans. But I think you all know that the real celebration will happen when Palestinians, whether those who are holed up in Gaza under siege or in the West Bank, who are watching their very land being taken away from them, or those who are languishing in refugee camps, or that whole Palestinian diaspora in the whole world, when, when that day will come when they will celebrate their empowerment in their own nation, enjoy independence and democracy, uh, and living with peace in peace with, uh, with their neighbors. This is the time we would all celebrate. Uh, but tonight we will focus on four honorees, and uh, uh, I need to do some uh, house cleaning, I guess, uh, house, housekeeping. We, the, the, uh, you, you see these giant stream, uh, screens behind me on both sides. Uh, you will see uh, aspects of Palestinian life in every, in every field, so please enjoy that. I also would like to remind you that we have a silent auction outside. There are beautiful pieces of art. So take a look, enjoy the art, and pull up a wallet and write a check. I mean, this is always a good thing to do. I never thought in my life that I'll be uh, raising funds for anybody. But there's always a first, I guess. And I think uh, before the secretary comes in with Ziad, um, Let's recognize uh, the board of the directors of the um, American Task Force on Palestine. So those of you who are in this room, please stand up so that we'll give you a, a nice hand. I can't see you because the lights are in my eyes, but uh, um, I mean, can I have some water? I mean, it's, uh, I'm, you, know, you know what they say about the Arabs? You can take them out of the desert, but you cannot get the desert out of them. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Ah, there's water here. Okay. All right, thank you. No, 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 I'm fine. I don't know where, where Ziad is. I'm sure he's holed up somewhere waiting for the secretary. Uh, I don't know what to tell you now. <laughs> I rarely find myself at a loss of words. I mean, I usually, when I speak to public, I always pontificate about political issues in the Middle East. But emceeing is not one of my forte, folks, so bear with me. I'll try to improvise, as jazz musicians, musicians would do, or as my favorite genre of music, my you know blues, blues men always um, improvise. So I'll try to do it tonight. I don't even have a guitar or a harmonica, but I can tell you stories about the blues men if you want. Yeah, that would be a good one too. You know what they say about the blues? The blues is the mother of all music. Uh, Anyway, we still have a few minutes uh, to take a look at that silent auction, folks. Anyway, seriously, this, this is, I mean, uh, when I look around and I see all these faces, when I see this huge gathering, and I remember the days years ago, come on guys, give me a break. Yes, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. Don't treat us like uh, Rodney Dangerfield here, huh? I remember the days years ago when an event on Palestine uh, would draw only a few people in this town. Today, 
Everybody knows about the Palestinian struggle. Everybody knows about the Palestinian yearning. Everybody knows stories about the Palestinian struggle for freedom and excellence. And, but, but the Palestinians still have a long way to go. But it's, it's lovely to see some of the old hands here. Um, students, businessmen, diplomats, former diplomats, professors, academics. And uh, it tells you something that I've been around this town for a long time. And uh, as they say, the struggle continues. Uh, but it's always lovely uh, to see such a large gathering lo like the one we have tonight. And uh, we're all waiting for the secretary to come. Uh, I'm sure she will give us uh, a status report on where we are in the peace talks. Uh, as you well know, many people in the Middle East, Palestinians and Israelis and Arabs and Muslims and Jews, had high hopes on this president and on this Secretary of State. And uh, uh, as a journalist, obviously, I'm, uh, I'm waiting to hear what the Secretary is going to give us, to tell us about what's happening. And uh, uh, so bear with us. She will be here any minute. Ziad Asali will introduce her. And remember that Hillary Clinton, long time ago, before she was elected to represent the great state of New York, spoke about the need for the Palestinians to have their own state. And she's been working doggedly with, uh, on this issue from day one, as, uh, as well as uh, uh, George Mitchell, special envoy to the Middle East. And uh, let's hope that she will tell us uh, some good news tonight. We've seen some negative developments in the last few weeks and months. And hopefully, she will have something positive to tell us tonight. Uh, but I'm sure she will give us uh, an excellent readout of a complex situation. So, I mean, is there any status report? What's happening outside in the real world? Okay, folks, what shall we talk about? Blues or politics? Blues, okay. <laughs> I guess I'll leave you have a drink or something, and we'll come back when Ziad uh, accompanies the secretary to address us. I mean, are they coming? They're here. Okay, folks, the secretary has arrived. It is with great pleasure. I'm not going to introduce her, but Ziad Asali, the president of the American Task Force on Palestine, will introduce the secretary. You all know Ziad. He doesn't need an introduction. Uh, but Ziad has some nice words to say. And uh, I'm told they just arrived. Any minute now. So when she when they come, please give her a, a wonderful hand. Okay, we're here. That's the moment for, that we've been waiting for. 
Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, accompanied by Ziad Asali, the President of the American Task Force on Palestine. Welcome. Thank you. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my singular honor to welcome on behalf of the Board of Directors of the American Task Force on Palestine, our keynote speaker this evening. We are often told it cannot be done. How many of us have heard that? How many of us have given up without trying? How many of us have stopped to wonder what would have happened if we had not? In this nation of immigrants, a country which celebrates new ideas and imagination, we learn to believe that our sons and daughters can do anything they want. However, who among us has been brave enough to want what has never been? And who among us has acted upon that desire? Secretary Clinton did. Hillary Rodham Clinton is the 67th Secretary of State, but the only one who has ever been First Lady. Presidential spouses. <laughs> presidential spouses cannot run for the Senate, and they certainly cannot run for the presidency themselves. However, in the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it, until it is done. Secretary Clinton has certainly destined, was certainly destined for success as a graduate of Wellesley College and Yale Law School. Those achievements alone have, been, have given a generation of women who came behind her the courage to seek positions of leadership and strength. However, she has, she has sought to be much more than a role model. She has transformed the way in which expectations were defined and achievements evaluated. While others were discussing the glass ceiling in Wall Street and K Street, Hillary Clinton refused to be stopped by any ceiling. When so many tried to define her in terms of what other women have done, she chose to define herself in terms, in terms of what it takes to be a leader. She has brought the, this courage to redefine the possible to her role as a national leader and a global diplomat. Madam Secretary, throughout your distinguished public career, people have often said that your goals were impossible. Yet, with boundless courage and tireless drive, you beat long odds and you overcame overwhelming obstacles. The Palestinians, too, are creating something which is difficult. They too chafe against a history which has discouraged veering from its path, and they too are being told that it cannot be done. Like people everywhere, Palestinians simply deserve a country where they can be first-class citizens. They have taken upon themselves the responsibility of building the institutions and the state of Palestine, the indispensable state for peace. Your bold statement that our country must assure that the Palestinians build the institutions of their future state, an effort which must continue during the negotiations, is one that we at ATFP applaud and support without reservation. Our legacy as we help them establish their state by ending the occupation and the conflict may also seem impossible until it is done. Madam Secretary, we welcome your leadership, your example, and your drive in pursuit of that goal. We look forward with great anticipation to hearing your remarks this evening. We understand that you have the choice among many forums to express the views and policy of this administration. 
We are indeed grateful that you have decided to be with us here tonight. Madam Secretary. I meant every word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ziad, for that introduction and for your leadership of this important organization and for you and the steadfast support that ATFP has given to the cause of peace. I'm pleased that uh, there are so many friends and colleagues here uh, tonight. Uh, and it is especially gratifying for me to have this opportunity uh, to address you. Before I begin, however, I want to take a moment to express our government's strong condemnation of today's disturbing reports of arson at a school warehouse near Nablus. There is never any justification for violence against civilians and an attack against a school is particularly outrageous. These incidents cannot be tolerated. We hope for a swift investigation and our thoughts and prayers are with those whose families have been affected. We meet at a time when we rightly can join together to celebrate the achievements and the mission of the American Task Force on Palestine and the four extraordinary Palestinian Americans that are being honored tonight. A soldier, a poet, a playwright, and a builder. Each story is unique, but together they represent the talent and dynamism of the Palestinian American community and the Palestinian diaspora around the world. In big cities and small towns across America, Palestinian Americans are contributing to the richness of our culture, the strength of our economy, and the liveliness of our democracy. The American Task Force on Palestine is also contributing to our country and our tradition of citizens gathering together to express their views and help shape the national debate. Now, when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East, it is all too easy for positions to harden into dogma, for tempers to flare, for rhetoric to outpace reality. But you have provided a welcome voice of reason and a steady advocacy on behalf of a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace in the Middle East. You have helped us see past the false choices of this conflict. Being pro-Palestinian does not mean you must reject Israel's right to exist. And <laughs> and being pro-Israel does not mean you must deny the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people. The path to security and dignity for both peoples lies in negotiations that result in two states living side by side in peace and prosperity and a comprehensive peace in the entire region. As this organization has emphasized, that outcome is also in the interests of the United States, as well as the people of the region and even people around the world. But most of all, it is in the interests of both Palestinians and Israelis. I have spoken frequently over the last year about why a two-state solution is critical to Israel's long-term future. America's commitment to Israel is rock solid and unwavering. And we will continue making this case openly and often because we see that as the best way for Israel to safeguard her future. But tonight I want to focus on why a two-state solution is essential to the future of the Palestinian people. Ziad referenced my time as First Lady. 
And as First Lady, I may have been the first person ever associated with an American administration to call for a Palestinian state and for the two-state solution. <laughs> this goal is now the official policy of the United States. And for Palestinians, a two-state solution would mean an independent, viable, and sovereign state of their and your own. The freedom to travel, to do business, and govern themselves. Palestinians would have the right to chart their own destinies at last. The indignity of occupation would end. And a new era of opportunity, promise, and justice would begin. It is difficult to think of anyone who has worked harder or longer to realize the dreams of the Palestinian people than President Mahmoud Abbas. Decades ago, it was Abu Mazen who saw that only through negotiation and nonviolence would, could, these aspirations become real. He has persevered through many difficult times and remained firm in his faith that an independent Palestine living side by side with Israel in peace and security is both possible and necessary. <laughs> he is a champion for the people, and he is a champion for peace, because President Abbas understands that the path that must be trod toward that state proceeds down two simultaneous tracks, negotiations between the parties and institution building that prepares Palestinians to govern themselves as we move toward and after an agreement is reached. Negotiations are not easy, but they too are absolutely necessary. It is always easier to defer decisions than it is to make them. As much as the United States and other nations around the world want to see a resolution to this conflict, only the parties themselves can take the difficult steps that will lead to peace. That is why the Obama administration is working so hard to support direct talks that offer a forum for both sides to grapple with the core issues in good faith. There is no substitute for face-to-face -face discussion and ultimately for an agreement that leads to a just and lasting peace. That is the only path that will lead to the fulfillment of the Palestinian national aspirations and the necessary outcome of two states for two peoples. But before I go further, I'd like to say a few words about the state-building track. Now, it may receive fewer headlines, but I believe, and many of you do as well, it is critically important. Today, although Palestinians still have many obstacles to overcome, it is easier than ever to envision an independent Palestine able to govern itself, uphold its responsibilities to provide for its own people, and ensure security. This gives confidence to negotiators on both sides and hope to those who have long looked forward to that day. Under President Abbas and Prime Minister Fayyad's leadership and under Prime Minister Fayyad's two-year plan, the Palestinian Authority is going beyond rhetoric and actually building a new reality. It is reversing a history of corruption and working hard to produce results that matter in Palestinians' daily lives. The pace of reform accelerated this year. The streets are safer, courts are handling more cases, taxes are being collected more efficiently. In the first half of this year, revenues were 50% higher than in the same period in 2009. This has fueled continued economic growth. New businesses are opening more than 100 new companies were registered in the West Bank in August alone. Everything from venture capital funds to local hardware stores. As a result, more and more Palestinians are finding jobs. Tourists and business travelers are arriving every day to take advantage of the improved security and economic climate. In fact, a new five-star hotel 
is due to open in Ramallah this month. Of course, considerable work remains. On the security front, the improvements have been impressive, but Palestinians could do more to discourage and denounce incitement that inflames tensions and undermines cooperation. On the economic front, many smaller communities have yet to see the benefits of greater prosperity. Unemployment remains high, above 15% in the West Bank and nearly 40% in Gaza during the second quarter of this year. So we can all do more to work together to reduce the Palestinian economy's dependence on foreign assistance and promote sustainable growth, especially by increasing foreign investment, not just more aid, making it easier for people and goods to move in and out of the territories. The work we've already done with the Palestinians and Israelis in these areas shows the impact we can have when we focus our efforts and makes the case for why all of us must do more. The Palestinian people have many partners who are working and investing every day to improve life in the West Bank and Gaza and to help lay the foundations of a future state. Private companies, philanthropies and foundations, universities, all of them are contributing expertise, energy, and effort. And there are many more who are looking to make a difference. The United States has launched a new initiative called Partners for a New Beginning, a regional initiative that is one of several efforts to bring together key players to focus on solving specific challenges. And our government remains fully committed. For example, last year we invested nearly $2 million to upgrade and reopen the Jalama crossing between Israel and the Northern West Bank, adding new lanes and inspection sites. As a result, the number of vehicles able to cross has steadily increased from zero to slightly, uh, to roughly around 7,500 cars and buses per week. Now this has had an impact. Arab Israeli shoppers spent an estimated $12 million in Janine this quarter. The markets are full and the streets are crowded and there's even a new movie theater. We've also worked with the Palestinian Authority, Israel and our international partners to ease the situation in Gaza and increase the flow of needed commercial goods and construction supplies while taking appropriate measures to ensure they don't fall into the wrong hands. Last week alone, consistent with the Palestinian Authority's focus on addressing water and electricity needs, more than 1,000 truckloads entered Gaza with food and goods like steel bars and cement to modernize the Gaza City wastewater treatment plant and electricity poles to upgrade power distribution. This is helping the people of Gaza and cutting into the illicit tunnel trade that has enriched Hamas and undermined the rule of law. Now we still need many more steps from Israel to enable more economic activity in Gaza, including exports that bolster legitimate business enterprises. <laughs> Our goal is to support sustainable economic growth in Gaza, and it's a little known fact that the Palestinian Authority is the principal financial supporter of Gaza. The people in Gaza are dependent upon the Palestinian Authority, which is another reason why the increase in economic activity in the West Bank is not only good for those who live in the West Bank, but those who live in Gaza as well. To help spur private investment through the Palestinian uh, territories, this summer the United States helped sponsor the Palestine Investment Conference in Bethlehem which generated $655 million in pledges targeted at high growth sectors. So Palestinians should take pride in all that has been accomplished in a short period of time. And the World Bank recently reported that if the Palestinian Authority maintains its momentum in building institutions and delivering public services, it is, and I quote, well positioned for the establishment of a state at any point in the near future. <laughs> Last month I visited Ramallah and saw this progress firsthand. After we crossed uh, the Betunya checkpoint, 
well-equipped Palestinian security officers lined the road. They are more professional and capable than ever, thanks to strong leadership and increased training that the United States has helped to assist. We, thank you. <laughs> we drove into the city and I could see new apartment buildings and office towers rising from the hills. The streets pulsed with commerce and activity. But as I looked at the faces of the men and women who came out of their shops and homes to watch us go by, it was impossible to forget the painful history of a people who have never had a state of their own. For most Americans, for most Americans, it is hard, if not impossible, to imagine living behind checkpoints and roadblocks without the comforts of peace or the confidence of self-determination. Economic and institutional progress are definitely important, indeed necessary, but not sufficient. The legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people will never be satisfied until there is a two-state solution, a two-state solution ensuring dignity, justice, and security for all. Now, I know that there are those who think that if they wait, scheme, or fight long enough, they can avoid compromising or negotiating. But I am here to say that that is not the case. That will only guarantee more suffering, more sorrow, and more victims. Violence in all forms is a dead end that perpetuates the conflict and empowers those on both sides who would exploit cynicism and discord. That is no path at all. Nor is it viable to build the institutions of a future state without the negotiations that will ultimately create it. Now, we have no illusions about the difficulty of resolving the final status issues of borders and security, of settlements and refugees of Jerusalem and water. And it's no secret that we are in a difficult period. When President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Washington last month to relaunch direct negotiations, we knew there would be setbacks and struggles. Our position on settlements is well known and has not changed. And our determination to encourage the parties to continue talking has not wavered. I cannot stand here tonight and tell you there is some magic formula that I have discovered that will break through the current impasse. But I can tell you we are working every day, sometimes every hour, to create the conditions for negotiations to continue and succeed. We are urging both sides to avoid any actions that would undermine trust or prejudice the outcomes of the talks. Senator Mitchell will soon return to the region for further consultations. We have not given up, and neither have President Abbas or Prime Minister Netanyahu. We remain convinced that if they persevere with negotiations, the parties can agree on an outcome that ends the conflict, reconciles the Palestinian goal of an independent and viable state based on the 1967 lines with agreed swaps, And Israel's goal of a Jewish state with secure and recognized borders that reflect subsequent developments and meet Israel's security requirements. This will resolve all the core issues and, as President Abbas said the other day, end all historical claims. Now, in any tough negotiation, it is natural to focus on what we are being asked to give up. But it is important to keep in mind what you, what Palestinians and Israelis stand to gain. In this case, 
The benefits are undeniable. You know, you can't put a price or a value on dignity, but it's a very precious commodity. Justice and security for both Israeli and Palestinian children alike. They deserve to grow up free from fear and to live up to their own God-given potential. As long as this conflict continues, that will never be possible. Bold leaders are called to rise above obstacles and seize opportunities to make history and put their people on a path to a better future. Since the beginning of September, I have spent hours and hours talking with the President and the Prime Minister. I have listened to them and I have watched them engage with each other. They are serious about this effort. They are grappling with the core issues. I am convinced they want to be the leaders who finally end this conflict. But they cannot do that without support from their people. And not only their people living in the region, but their people living here and elsewhere around the world. All of us who are committed to peace and the right of both peoples to live in security and dignity have a responsibility to do what we can to help them succeed. You who are Palestinian Americans are here tonight because you understand that. And this organization has stood for that over so many years. The Arab states and the people of the region have a strong interest in resolving this conflict, and they too have an important role to play. I deeply appreciate the support that Arab leaders and nations have provided for direct talks and for the vision embodied in the Arab Peace Initiative. I hope they will all continue to support the Palestinians in their diplomatic efforts and the state building work on the ground. The Palestinian Authority needs a larger, steadier, and more predictable source of financial support. The United States is proud to be the Palestinian Authority's largest donor. The European Union has stepped up as well. But the broader international community, including many Arab states, can and should provide more financial support. It takes far more than <laughs> commitments and plans to support making the state of Palestine a reality. And in fact, as the Palestinian economy has increased the need for Future assistance has decreased, but there is still a gap, and that gap has to be filled. So as we press ahead with diplomacy, I hope that Arab states will also consider how to begin implementing the Arab Peace Initiative in concrete terms to turn that proposal into a reality as well. And finally, those states in the region that are supplying weapons to groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas must stop. They should publicly reject the divisive voices who seek to discourage peace. And I will repeat today what I've said many times before, Gilad Shalit must be released immediately and returned to his family. People on all sides of this conflict must choose to move beyond a history they cannot change to embrace a future they can shape together. The poet Naomi Shihab Naj, whom we are honoring tonight, understands this. She writes powerfully about the unfulfilled aspirations of the Palestinian people. What flag can we wave, she asks. But she also says, I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. And that,
That is the biggest obstacle of them all. I know people cannot forget. I know most people cannot forgive. But I do know also that the future holds the possibility of progress, if not in our lifetimes, then certainly in our children's. I spend much of my time now as Secretary of State traveling around the world, speaking with people who find it so hard to move beyond the past. It is not just in the Middle East that that remains a challenge. And yet when I speak with young people, they are focused on tomorrow and they deserve that tomorrow. A tomorrow filled with opportunities for them to make their own destinies and to help their own people realize that collective aspiration. The American Task Force for Palestine has been a consistent advocate for this path, and I thank you for your efforts. But I know that some in this room, like many across the region and the world, have your doubts about the prospects for peace. So let me appeal to you tonight. Please don't give up in the face of difficulty. Through your charitable work, you already make important contributions to the progress that is happening on the ground that is literally changing Palestinian lives. You have funded thousands of cataract operations that helped Palestinians see again. Students in the West Bank are learning on laptops because of your generous support. But there is so much more to be done. The Palestinian American community has so much talent and expertise. So please continue putting it to work, helping build the future Palestinian state. Offer legal advice or medical training. Invest in the economy, help build the infrastructure. The Palestinian people, as you yourselves know so much better than I, are hardworking, resilient people. They're ready to work. They're ready to govern themselves. But they can't do it on their own. There is another way you can contribute as well. Many of you are leaders in your own communities. Others here and over there take their cues from you. So when you leave tonight, I hope you will be champions for this cause. Keep writing and speaking. Keep working for tolerance and understanding. Keep building a broad constituency for peace that will support and even insist on the hard choices that are needed. In the end, peace is not made just at the negotiating table. It's made around the kitchen table. It grows from the quiet determination of people, men and women, who are willing to stand up and declare themselves advocates for peace. I've seen this happen in conflicts from Latin America to Europe to Africa to Asia. I've seen warriors who were once aiming guns at each other, sitting down and planning a new way forward for governing together. I've seen women who feared every day that their husband went to work or their son went out at night, that he wouldn't return, working with women on the other side of that divide to find a way to understand, but not just stopping there, changing attitudes and building institutions together. This is not easy. If it were, anybody could have done it already. We've had leaders who have given their lives to this work. And now we have a moment in time that we must seize. I urge you to help lead the way. And I promise you this, the Obama administration will not turn our backs on either the people of Palestine or Israel.
We will continue working for and God willing achieving the just, lasting, and comprehensive peace that has been a cornerstone of U.S. policy for years. I thank you for what you have already done. I thank you for your commitment. I congratulate the honorees, and I challenge you to be part of the most important work there is, the work of peace. God bless you. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. And now we resume our program. We'll start with serving dinner. And soon we will start the process of honoring our four honorees. The Secretary spoke about the resilient, the resilient people of Palestine. And we can only hope that the next two years of the Obama administration, we will see real progress on the road to peace and prosperity for the Palestinians and their neighbors. Before we presume our program, just want to remind you about the silent auction. And now, we will start our, would you please? Calm down, folks. OK, thank you. We will start by honoring Colonel Peter Mansour. A distinguished military man with a distinguished career. Introducing him will be Dr. Williamson Murray, a noted historian, a military historian. Dr. Murray is an academic program fellow at the Potomac Institute and a professor emeritus of history at the Ohio State University. Come on, folks. All right. Dr. Murray has served as the Secretary of the Navy Fellow at the Navy War College. He taught at various military schools and academies in this country, including the Army War College, U.S. Naval Academy, and Air War College, and the United States Military Academy. He has written extensively on military affairs in the 20th century in Europe and the Middle East. He is the author of The Air War in the Persian Gulf, as well as the Iraq War and military history. It's with a great deal of honor that I introduce to you Dr. Williamson Murray, who will introduce Colonel Peter Mansour. Uh, it is my uh, distinct uh, a uh, pleasure and uh, uh, a great honor to be asked uh, to introduce um, a great American, a great Palestinian American scholar, soldier, a defender of the United States for 26 years. I first met uh, Cadet Peter Mansour in 1981. Uh, he was a student of mine at Ohio State University uh, for two years 
where he earned uh, his PhD as well as his master's degree. Uh, and he has had an exceptional uh, career in the United States Army to include not only command of a brigade in Baghdad, where he played a major role uh, in uh, dealing with the insurgency, uh, but then was the gatekeeper for General uh, uh, Petraeus during the surge, which brought some hope uh, for Iraq. So let me uh, turn uh, this over to uh, Colonel, retired United States Army, Professor Peter Mansour, the Mason Professor at Ohio State University. Well, Wick, uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's not going uh, too far to say that uh, without your guidance and mentorship over these past two decades, I would not be standing on this, this stage this evening. The time I spent at The Ohio State University uh, studying under the tutelage of Alan Millett and you were among the most uh, intellectually fruitful of my life. And I am privileged to stand here tonight not just as your student, but as your lifelong friend. I'd um, also like to thank the American Task Force on Palestine for this singular recognition. I am both humbled and honored to accept the organization's Distinguished National Service Award. There are so many people who have touched my life in the past half century, from the good folks in my birthplace of New Ulm, Minnesota, to my family and teachers who helped raise me in Sacramento, California, to the officers who took me under their wing during my education at West Point, and the mentors who supported me during my 26-year career in the Army, among them General David Petraeus, with whom I had the privilege a great American in himself, with whom I had the privilege to serve during the crisis years in Iraq. It is not often that one is, has the opportunity to help change the course of history. And I am grateful that I was able, in some small way, to help turn around a failing war effort during the surge of 2007 and 2008. Now I will speak the only er words of Arabic I know, Ana Ausli Min Ramallah. Actually, I know a few more, but... Uh, and as I discovered out there in the reception, there's 38,000 others in the United States who can say the same thing. I was, of course, aware of my Arab identity from an early age. But the full import of my heritage didn't hit me until my first tour in Iraq as a brigade commander stationed in Baghdad. In mid-July 2003, I was inspecting the position of one of my units guarding the Sheridan Hotel downtown when one of the sergeants asked me if I was going to have lunch with the sheikhs. The thought intrigued me, not just because I was tired of military rations, but because I understood the role of tribes in, Arab, in Arabic society. So I walked into the hotel, uh, into a ballroom much like this, and there seated in, uh, in the ballroom, in a scene straight out of Lawrence of Arabia, were 250 tribal sheikhs in their flowing robes. They greeted me warmly and invited me to address the group. By the way, as I got up to address them, I looked out over the sea of 250 tribal sheikhs, I froze because they all looked like my dad. <laughs> but what those sheikhs represented was civil society in the Arabic tradition. To our detriment, we ignored them for far too long in Iraq. Ironically, the tribes proved to be a major part of the solution to turning the war around when all looked lost in 2006 and they sided with us to destroy Al-Qaeda in Iraq. What I learned from this experience is that genuine progress in difficult conflicts requires finding willing partners in the quest for peace. When extremists control the agenda, then politics become frozen. And that, in a nutshell, 
is the purpose of groups like the American Task Force on Palestine, a moderate voice for Palestinian Americans and a willing partner in the search for a lasting and just peace in the Middle East. May God bless the voice of moderates in that endeavor. Thank you again for this special evening and thank you for this great honor. Our next honoree is an accomplished poet, Naomi Shihab Nye, and she will be introduced by Marjorie Ransom. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Marjorie, and uh, she's an old friend. I've known her, I've known her wonderful late husband, David. Uh, Marjorie is known to us as someone who has been interested in the art and history of the Middle East. Uh, Marjorie served as an American diplomat in Egypt, India, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and the United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. She is the recipient of two research grants. Ms. Ransom is writing a book on Yemeni traditional silver jewelry. It's a great deal of pleasure that I'd give you Marjorie Ransom, who will introduce Naomi Shihab Nye. Thank you, Hisham. I want to thank the American Task Force for Palestine for this opportunity to introduce my dear friend, the renowned poet, Naomi Shihab Nye. And I want to tell you that Naomi will be back in Washington. She will read at the Folger Shakespeare Library next April 11th. Naomi's honors and accomplishments are legend, but what makes her so special to me is that she is our family's poet. We first met in 1982. I was intrigued by the announcement of her program and took my teenage daughters kicking and screaming to their first poetry recital which she gave at the barns at Wolf Trap. The beauty of Naomi's writing is that it has layers of meaning and appeals to all ages. The girls were bowled over when they heard her read and sing her poems, and her poetry became standard fare for our family. Our relationship grew stronger when Naomi and her husband Michael came to Abu Dhabi in 1984 where I was the U.S. cultural attache, seeking ways to establish cultural bonds with that young nation. I never could have imagined what an impact she would have. In Abu Dhabi at the new UAE Cultural Center, in the women's section of the UAE University, and finally at Dubai, Dubai TV, she bowled them all over. She was a media star overnight. On my 60th birthday, my husband and daughters gave me a collection of Naomi's poems, Words Under the Words, and he and each of my three daughters inscribed one of her poems to me. I read from one of those, you know who you are. Why do your poems comfort me, I ask myself? Because they are upright like straight back chairs. I can sit in them and study the world as if it too were simple and upright. Because sometimes I live in a hurricane of words and not one of them can save me. Your poems come in like a raft, logs tied together, they float. I give you Naomi, she had none. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. My gratitude to Marjorie Ransom for her profound lifetime work bridging cultures and befriending so many. My deepest thanks 
to Naila and Ziad Asali for your gracious consideration and your advocacy. Thank you for thinking of me for tonight. To the Honorable Secretary of State Hillary Clinton for accepting one of the hardest jobs in the world and working so tirelessly on behalf of dialogue and justice. To my fellow, my fellow honorees tonight, a toast. And to all the young readers who've responded to poems and stories over the years with open hearts and minds, saying things like, I will never look at the news in the same way again, or my family just got larger. To the representatives of Seeds of Peace here tonight, you are some of my heroes. Don't ever let anyone talk you out of connection. My father, journalist Aziz Shihab, spoke up for Palestine every day of his life. He wrote, try as we could, my old people, the Palestinians and I, could never get into the good graces of Americans. Strong, dusty winds against us, constantly blowing. Americans blinded from knowing or caring that my land was dear to me. I think he would be very touched by all the remarks here tonight. He would want me to thank you for knowing and for caring. We believe the job of peacemaking, inclusion, and mutual respect and support for justice belongs to all of us. As the end of my poem, Jerusalem says, it's late, but everything comes next. Thank you all for believing in next. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Naomi. I have a spe special kinship with Naomi. First thing I published in my life was few poems in Mawakif, a literary journal edited by the great poet Adonis. Uh, and I've always been a fan of uh, Naomi's work. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce to you the Palestinian ambassador in Washington, Ma'an Rashid Arikat. Who will be reading a letter from the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas. Ma'an is very well known to you. Uh, he was born in Jericho in 1960. He's a young lad. He, comes, he hails from a well-known political family. He struggled as a young man for Palestine, and he was jailed twice by the Israelis at age 16 and 17 tough guy, and for the last few years he's been representing uh, Palestine Liberation Organization in Washington. Hopefully someday he will open up a full-fledged embassy, Man Rashid Arikat. Thank you, Hisham. Masa al khair, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ziad Asali, President of the American Task Force on Palestine, board members of ATFP. This is the second year in a row that I stand here on this stage before you in my capacity as personal envoy of President Mahmoud Abbas, the President of Palestine, and the Palestine Liberation Organization to the United States. The general delegation of the PLO 
in Washington, D.C. is proud to take part in ATFP's fifth annual gala. The Palestinian leadership and the general delegation of the PLO are committed to supporting the efforts undertaken by the American task force to promote and to protect the Palestinian national cause in the United States. It is my honor now to read the letter sent by President Mahmoud Abbas on this occasion. Dr. Ziad Asali, President, American Task Force of Pal on Palestine. Dear Dr. Asali, ladies and gentlemen, I extend my best wishes to your members and guests at your fifth annual gala and to all participants in this important event for the American Task Force on Palestine. I wish you success in achieving your goals as American citizens of Palestinian origin. As you seek to effectively influence your society and your country. This will have a positive impact on the Palestinian cause and the peace process giving the importance of the United States. It brings me pleasure and pride that members of our Palestinian community have achieved such astounding successes in such various fields. The theme of your gathering, Building Palestine, the Indispensable State for Peace, has become an important, an imperative that enjoys the widest international acceptance and support. I want to stress that the path to peace must be achieved through ending the occupation that occurred in 1967 and the establishment of the State of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital living side by side with the State of Israel. The role of the United States in achieving the peace we seek in our region is central and indispensable. American policies regarding the conflict have gone through an important evolution which we highly value. During the administration of President Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, and now with the administration of President Obama, the United States has come to acknowledge our right to self-determination and the need for establishing our independent state and ending the occupation that occurred in 1967. The United States also opposes all forms of Israeli settlement activity in our land. In addition, the United States contributes economically and financially in supporting the institutions of the Palestinian National Authority. You as American citizens in this great country whose people believe in freedom and democracy are playing a role that we highly appreciate in advocating the justice of our people's cause. Our people yearn for freedom, peace, and to live in a free, democratic, independent state like the rest of the peoples in this world. May God bless you and guide you on your path. Ramallah, October 19th to 13th, 2010, Mahmoud Abbas, President of the State of Palestine, Chairman of the Executive Committee of the PLO. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador Arakat. And now I'll leave you in peace to enjoy your dinner. And when we come back, while you're eating your dessert, we will present you a different kind of dessert here on stage in the uh, form of Maysoon Zaid. She's an actress and professional stand-up comedian. Enjoy your dinner. We're back. The program is back. We are back. We resume our proceedings. You had your fun. Enjoy the dessert. And give us some quiet, please. All right. I was told to use my whip. Okay. Some discipline, please. Okay. Before, before we get my soon, one of the best stand-up comic, Palestinian comics in this country, Ziad Asali, the president of the American Task Force on Palestine, has a special announcement. Ziad, where are you? Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Uh, obviously, obviously, the speech of uh, Secretary Hill Clinton has been so effective that we have already elicited a response, an enthusiastic response, from Dr. Adnan Mjalli. Dr. Adnan Mjalli is a Palestinian American who was honored at this podium a couple of years ago for distinguished excellence in, in science and technology. He owns a pharmaceutical company, Trans, Trans Tech Pharma. Sorry, Adnan. Uh, and and uh, in South Carolina, he employs 25, North Carolina. Uh, the spirit matters, though. Uh, he employs 2,500 people, 250 PhDs. He owns over 1,200 patents, patents for scientific achievement. He works in fields like diabetes, cancer, research, and aging, which comes handy for people like me, and uh, is already an established pharmaceutical company vied for by the major pharmaceutical companies to purchase him. We're waiting for the purchase because we're gonna get some real dividends after that. <laughs> but for now, Dr. Adnan Mjalli has decided to establish a fellowship in his name for the American Task Force on Palestine for $100,000. So thank you. Thank you, Ziad. And now we'll give you a different kind of dessert. Maysoon Zaid is an actress and a professional stand up comedian who received her Bachelor of uh, fine art in acting from Arizona State University. She has been uh, uh, active in the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. Uh, I can read all the, you know, half a page of, uh, you know, uh, biographical information on her, but let me tell you, in few words, she's zany, she's hilarious, she's outrageous, she's scandalous, and um, she just broke her fingers and she told me, I told her my story, which is very simple actually. I went with this young chick to this bar and, and there were about five Marines there who just gave me a bad look. And you should see what happened to them. You know? And I said, what happened to you? She said, I went with five Fatah guys, five Hamas guy, guys, and one Syrian fellow. And look what happened to me, she broke her finger. But she is really outrageous, and uh, you know the worst. I mean, the most difficult uh, um, uh, stand-up comic of any kind is political, and it is wonderful to watch this Palestinian woman um, using politics and humor um, to talk about her, her own experience and the experience of the Palestinian people, and um, I'm thrilled to introduce her and I have been a big fan of her. 
Please welcome Maysoon Zaid. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's it's All right, let's see what's going to happen with the dress and the stool. And oh my God, stand up. Okay. Ha. Hello, Washington, D.C. I am so happy right now. You finally stopped talking. Mashallah. Give yourself a round of applause. Ah, okay. For the, by round of applause, by round of applause, who has never seen me before? Anyone? Okay. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Maysoon Zayed, and no, I am not drunk. But the doctor who delivered me was Yuksuf Amra, okay? So just really quickly to catch you up, as a result, I have cerebral palsy, which means I shake all the time. So I'm half Shakira Shakira, and half Yasser Arafat. Oh my God. This has been a very, very, very crazy night. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm here because Ziad made me come here. He told me that if I didn't, that there would be no two-state solution. So here I am. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you guys a little bit about myself, a little bit about where I come from. I am the daughter of Al-Hajj Musa Zayed and Dr. Ribhiya Ali. My father looks exactly like Saddam Hussein. And my mother looks like Haifa Wahbi. <laughs> and um, my parents, for, you know, again, for those of you who don't know me, my parents are the most romantic Arab couple in the history of mankind. They met in the most romantic way. And like, Americans don't know that Arabs are romantic. They don't know we're romancy. It's like they never watched Lawrence of Arabia. But I want to tell you about my mom and dad. The way they met is hands down the most romantic story ever. They're first cousins. <laughs> oh, yeah. My dad swears to God that the day that he saw my mother, he knew. He knew. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, how did you know that mommy was the one? And he said, your grandfather, he told me. But it's amazing, it's amazing that Ziad and Naila got me out here tonight. First of all, um, I do have to admit something. I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't know what I was doing tonight. I had no idea. I thought this was the American tobacco and firearms. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Thought they were gonna let me shoot again, but no, apparently. Um, but the reason I'm here is it's, it's really special because I'm getting married next week. <laughs> and the only person in the world that could get me to work the week before I was getting married is Ziad because he's paying for the wedding. Um, so if you guys could be generous, I still haven't paid the limo. Please donate, please. No, this is a valid Palestinian cause. You might be sitting there and going, oh my God, how are we donating to ATFP if they're paying for this woman's wedding? Well, let's talk about this. Am I not the ultimate Palestinian cause? <laughs> Up until today, I was known as a Palestinian Muslim virgin with cerebral palsy. I'm 33 and single. In Arab years, that's 67. I need this wedding. <laughs> By round of applause, where are all my single ladies? I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things. One, single ladies, if you would like to catch yourself a husband like I did, I can give you some very simple advice. Go to the one place in the world that you will definitely, definitely catch a husband. You know where you should go? Go where I went. Go to Gaza. Yeah, I went to Gaza to catch a husband. Why? Because they got no place to run. <laughs> this is what I did. I put my American passport in a nice big old frame, and I just walked through that refugee camp, dodging the bullets, going, hey, you want a visa, baby? Shh. 
Oh, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut the tension in the room. I know some of you are very angry right now. My round of applause. Who's angry right now? Just my dad. Okay. <laughs> um, but for those of you who are angry right now, I just have one. I'm going to say something serious. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. My one serious thing to say is for everyone who's really feeling angry right now, do me one favor. Visit Palestine. Stop talking about it, get on a plane, visit Palestine. Just go. Just go. Just go. And I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I'm not allowed to be serious, but I'm going to be for a second. Because, you know, I go to Palestine every year. I was privileged enough to bump into Ziad in Jerusalem. And I have to tell you guys, go. It's disappearing. If you don't go soon, we're not going to be able to do this together. So we need your guys' help. We need you to support this organization. But more than anything else, we need you to visit Palestine. So thank you. Now, I go visit Palestine every single year. Every single year I go back there. And it's crazy because every single year, my best friend since I was five years old, Tina, She's this Italian Catholic girl from Jersey. She gets really confused as to why I'm going to Palestine. So her original question used to be, yo, Mimi, aren't you scared to go to Pakistan? <laughs> and so, the, you know, this year she was like, are you gonna go back there again? I'm like, yeah. She goes, when are you going? I go, I'm going at Christmas, because I'm planning to go back at Christmas. She goes, who the heck goes to Pakistan with Bam Bam? At Christmas, and I go, Tina, you know, Jesus was born in Palestine. And she looked at me and she went, no stupid, he was born at the Vatican. <laughs> he wasn't, I know. No, she believes us, it's true. So apparently I'm getting married, and I want to tell you guys a little bit about my fiance. First of all, when I got engaged, I was really, really excited because he's Palestinian, he's Muslim, he's never been divorced, no kids, no disease. He's like a Palestinian unicorn, right? <laughs> but then, you like the finger? I gotta tell you guys about the finger. It's a very simple story. I, I went to Canada and broke my finger. Why? Because they have socialized healthcare and I could. <laughs> I was like, blam! <laughs> um, no, but... <laughs> so here's what happened. I get engaged. I'm all excited because I'm not going to die alone and be eaten by dogs, and I bring my fiancé to America. And let me tell you something. It is very difficult to bring a 30-year-old single Muslim man who's been in jail for six years to America. Um, but I did, and I went to the airport to pick him up, and as soon as he walked off the plane, I had immediate buyer's remorse. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I remember you being taller and having two eyebrows. <laughs> and, and like, apparently, um, I'm not domestic. Like, I don't know how to do anything. I brought him to America, and um, I always heard that refugees were starving, but for some reason, mine needs to be fed all the time. <laughs> what is that? My mom calls me every day after work going, did you feed your refugee? <laughs> I'm like, it won't eat, it's depressed. Um, <laughs> no, but we're getting married and I'm, I'm, I'm panicking about a couple of things and I'm happy about a couple of things. So I'll talk about what I'm happy about first. I'm really, really happy about my bridesmaid's dresses. Um, because for those of you who don't know, when a girl gets married, she dresses her girlfriends as fugly as possible. Yeah, she has to make them ugly so she can look perfect, right? And um, so it's my turn to get back at my friends because I've been a bridesmaid 17 times. So what I decided to do is, instead of buying them ugly dresses, which would be mean, I'm gonna make it educational. I'm dressing them all in burkas. <laughs> They'll be pastel, don't worry. But I have this fear, and my fear is, part of the tradition of a Palestinian wedding is that um, the Palestinian bride is supposed to dance with candles, okay? How many people think I shouldn't be handling fire? 
But here's the issue. Not only am I dancing with candles, I'm dancing with candles surrounded by women in burkas. <laughs> Next thing you know, they're ablaze and it's like a KKK rally gone bad, people. <laughs> but there is one thing that I am looking forward to, which is the bouquet toss. Because I always hated the bouquet toss, because as an old single woman, I had to go and catch the bouquet. And catching, not my thing. But now it's my turn. And what I've decided to do is, I'm not going to throw the bouquet over my shoulder, like tradition. I'm going to throw it forward. Because although I have cerebral palsy and I'm not good at catching, I'm Palestinian. I'm really good at throwing. <laughs> Can I talk about Rick Lazio for just one second? <laughs> Washington, D.C., do you know who Rick Lazio is? You're allowed to clap for him just once. Do you know who Rick Lazio is? OK, I'm going to tell you about Rick Lazio. We had a problem up in New York City. In New York City, they wanted to build an Islamic center, and Rick Lazio is a racist. <laughs> That's basically the way it breaks down. So he was running for governor, and his big platform was that he hated Arabs. So I've decided a way to get back at Rick Lazio, and I'm going to share it with you, but you can't tell him, OK? <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. Every single campaign needs a token disabled person. I'm going to make it me. <laughs> and then when he brings me up on stage for the photo op, where I come like limping up and we show that Rick Lazio is a great guy, as soon as I shake his hand, I'm just going to go, I'm Palestinian next year in Jerusalem. Yay! <laughs> Are you guys having a good time? Are you going to go visit Palestine? Nice. OK, as is tradition, my final joke is in Arabic. Why? Because this is a Palestinian event, even if it's an American event. So we're going to speak in Arabic. If you don't know Arabic, find a friend. They will explain the joke. And um, for those of you who are conservative, this is not offensive. So I start off in English by saying, I'm getting married on Halloween. And uh, I'm sure like some of you are like, who is this fool that's marrying this crazy woman on stage? You will never see his picture, because I refuse, refuse to tag a single picture of my fiance on Facebook. And for those of you too old to know what Facebook is, it's OK. You'll die soon. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, you will never see a picture of my fiance on Facebook. Why? Because I'm afraid he'll get jinxed. Arabs are afraid of the evil eye. We're afraid that if you compliment something, if you say something is good, if you say something is cute, that that thing will drop dead. And this is how I grew up, which leads me to my Arabic joke. So بدل ما تقولي يا تيتا اسم الله عليك ولا يا تيتا محلاك كانت تقولي يا تيتا الله يفتح لك قبر ولا كانت تطلع علي وتقولي يا تيتا طلق يشيل مخك إن شاء الله ولا تطلع علي وتقولي سطح يستحج بس أمي أمي ما كانت لك ستي أمي ما كان عندها مسبات هيد لايك أشكال ألوان أمي بس كان عندها مسبة واحدة يلعن أبوك في كندرة <تصفيق> My name is Maysoon Zayed Next year in Jerusalem إن شاء الله Thank you so much ATFP Thank you Told you she's great. OK, before we resume our program, just a reminder about the silent auction. And also, a reminder of the need to help the American charities for Palestine. As you well know, a portion of the proceeds of this event will go to help
the American Charities for Palestine. And okay, folks, we will release you soon. Just give us your attention for a few minutes, please. And now we resume. Uh, I will be introducing George Salem. Now we're, we come to our third honoree tonight, Betty Shamir, who will be introduced. <laughs> Those of you who know Off-Broadway and Off-Off-Broadway know Betty Shamir well. Uh, but I'll leave that uh, uh, to George Salem. Let me say a few words about George. George is an old friend of mine. We're old hands here in Washington. I met George uh, many years ago when he was a young lad, where he served from 1985 to 1989 as the solicitor of labor. He was the youngest, I think he's the first, or maybe uh, the Palestinian who, who were, uh, uh, testified in Congress, uh, uh, who were confirmed by the Senate for that position as the solicitor of labor um, uh, during the Reagan years. Uh, George is a very well uh, known uh, lawyer. He recently established the law offices of George Salem, recently that is in 2005. Um, he has been active in Republican politics for a long time. Uh, most of us know him as a wonderful friend and um, uh, a Palestinian who has been uh, serving the Palestinian cause for decades, uh, particularly during those difficult days uh, when the American-Palestinian dialogue began almost light years ago. So with a great deal of pleasure, uh, let me introduce you to George Salem. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Hashem, and good evening. It is indeed a privilege to present an award to a daughter of Ramallah for excellence in the performing arts. <laughs> Betty Shamia is an internationally produced playwright and novelist. Her play, Roar, was the first play by a Palestinian-American playwright to premiere off-Broadway. Roar was selected as a New York Times critic's pick for four weeks and is currently being taught at universities across the United States. Her other off-Broadway productions include The Black Eyed and The Machine, which was directed by Academy Award winner Marissa Tomei. Betty is a graduate of Harvard College and the Yale School of Drama and one of the rare American artists to be awarded funds by the National Endowment for the Arts twice. She performed in her play, Chocolate and Heat, Growing Up Arab in America, in three critically acclaimed New York runs and over 20 university theaters throughout the country. Many of her 15 plays have been produced in translation including Austria, Greece, Holland, Sweden, and Romania. Betty's contributions to theater and literature have not gone unnoticed. Her life and her work have been the subject of features in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the International Herald Tribune, among others. The New York Times says the following about her work, and I quote, the young writer, Betty Shamia, has the playwright's most essential gift, the passion for talk. Well, after all, been Philistine. Miss Shamia's rich, urgent prose will catch you up, then fling you into a character's life as though it were your own, end quote. Betty, Betty was recently one of the youngest artists to be named a fellow at Harvard University's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. 
she is a source of great pride, not only to her parents, both of whom are here with us this evening, but to the entire Palestinian community. Please join me in congratulating this year's awardee for excellence in the performing arts, Ms. Betty Shamia. Thank you for this honor. A South African activist named Stephen Biko said something I think of often when I consider the role of Palestinian American intellectuals and artists. Um, I'm not speaking until there's quiet in the back. Thank you. Stephen Biko said, the greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So basically, what he is saying is that the worst thing a person with more political, economic, or military might can do is make you lose hope and faith in yourself and the chance of ever making change or achieving justice. So as I look around this room, I realize there is only one thing that unites us as Palestinian Americans who are different religions, classes, education levels, and have different political affiliations. The thing that unites our community is the story we tell ourselves and our children, not only about where we came from, but where we are going. We decide what is the next chapter in the Palestinian American story. I was told all my life by Palestinians and non-Palestinians that I would never make it working in American theater if I ever talked about Palestine, that it would be impossible for me to have an impact or a voice. Whatever small success I have achieved has been in spite of the constant messages of defeatism that are rife within our community. Had I not had two wonderful parents who believed in me and encouraged my crazy dreams, I don't think I ever would have had the courage to even try. So as we continue to try to assimilate, I ask those of you who have children who want to pursue a non-traditional career to think about giving them another message besides, you'll never make it in a field that requires innovation. Better play it safe. Better be a doctor or a lawyer. What if instead we told our children, there is no door that is closed to you. I know you can achieve anything you set your mind to. Be prepared to work hard, maybe twice as hard as someone else. But if someone is going to succeed, I know it will be you. What if we imparted in our children the knowledge that there is a difference between making a good living and living a good life? Arts are an essential part of the assimilation of every ethnic group in America. And if we take the experience of the African American movement as our model, and it's a great one, we see you only have a black president after you have the Cosby Show. You only get the Cosby Show after black comics really make it in the comedy world. They are able to infiltrate that world only after black writers make inroads in theater and books and tell their stories in a language so strong that the human truth of their experiences cannot be denied. Palestinian American artists are excelling in every field, from theater, visual arts, film, and comedy. We who are pioneering in these fields need your financial support, but we need something more than your money, though it's appreciated. <laughs> we need your time. I encourage you to make it a priority to go see the work of our artists who are devoting their lives to telling our stories because they know if we do not do so, others will tell our stories for us. Soon enough and sooner than we think, I believe an Arab American can not only be Miss America, but can also be Mr. or Mrs. President. And I hope that maybe it's somebody's grandchild in this room. Thank you.
Thank you, Betty. And now our fourth and final honoree, and we have a special treat here because we have a son introducing, a proud son introducing his father. Uh, so I'll introduce you to Joseph Salami, who is only 22 years old, he just arrived from London. He just graduated from Cornell University, majoring in economics, and he would like to go to law school later on. But he just started his first job working for Booz Allen, like father, like son. And uh, uh, he is now a business analyst, and hopefully uh, he will be a brilliant lawyer later on. Uh, so I'll give you uh, Joseph Salami. Where's Joe? Good evening. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing a man whose story brings great pride to the Palestinian community. A man whose identity as a Palestinian American shaped him more than anything else, gave him his relentless drive and deep-rooted values. To recognize his accomplishments is to recognize overcoming a lifetime of adversity. He surmounted the challenges of being not only an immigrant, but also a refugee. He came to the United States and enrolled in college, financing his education by working menial jobs, with low pay and long hours. After earning a degree in engineering and later an MBA, he began his 30-year ascent to the top of one of the most prestigious management consulting firms. He's worked tirelessly to give his family every opportunity he never had and instill the same work ethic, drive, and values in his children. Though outwardly identifying as a Palestinian American was never easy, internally it created the character that drove him to greatness. Dad, we all look up to you, thank you, and applaud you. Your family could not be more proud. Please join me in recognizing my father, Ghassan Salome. Thank you, son. <laughs> Task Force board members, ladies and gentlemen, I am very humbled to be part of this outstanding group of awardees and honorees. Their achievements and contributions are unbelievable. When Dr. Asali informed me of the award, I felt a range of emotions, pride, joy, excitement, and a touch of fear. Yes, a touch of fear. Six years ago, after 32 years in this country, and only after I made senior partner, I finally got the courage to publicly admit I am Palestinian American. <laughs> the fear of being labeled of being stereotyped, the fear for my kids, and the fear for my job stopped me from coming out. And for years, I was tormented by it. I want to thank Ziad and the work that he and many of you are doing to give people like me the courage to be unafraid, to be proud Palestinian American to be able to openly speak about the suffering of Palestinians and at the same time be a loyal U.S. citizen who cares deeply about this great country. A Japanese poet once wrote, the world grows stronger as each story is told. And my story is similar to that of many of, of you here tonight and other Palestinians in countries around the world. Who, are up, who were uprooted and forced to find new homes. My parents fled Palestine to Lebanon in 1948. My dad lost both his eyes in a tragic accident shortly thereafter. So my mom, So my mom had to become the head of our household. 
care for four boys who are here tonight and my father and take responsibility for our survival. And like many other Palestinian refugees, we relied on the United Nations for schooling and a monthly allotment of food, cloth clothing, and other essentials. My mom also worked as a seamstress doing piecemeal work, piecemeal work, and my older brother had to quit school at 15 to work full time. In 1972, and barely 20, I left home and came to the U.S. to study. I put myself through college, helped my family immigrate, and settle here. And after 38 years of hard work, my old family and my new family are living the American dream. But the real dream we want to see is for all Palestinians to have a home of their own. I feel very fortunate, privileged, and honored to be receiving this award. I would not have been able to, to make it without the help and generosity of many people and institutions. As Secretary Clinton has said, it takes a village. It really does take a village. In my case, it takes a whole country, this country, to make me who I am today. I am so thankful and appreciative and unbelievably proud to be a citizen of the United States of America. I am absolutely certain that there's no other place on earth where someone like me, the son of Palestinian refugees, growing up below the poverty line, dependent on the United Nations for food, shelter, education, and survival, can make it to the top of one of the most prestigious companies in the world and be honored by you tonight. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Since Hassan spoke about his mother, and he's giving her a hug now, and since his mother is a big fan of mine, she watches me on television, that's what she says, says to me, so I think we would like to uh, please stand up so that we can recognize you, Georgette. Come on. You don't have to be Palestinian to be proud of these four honorees. Uh, um, I'm not Palestinian. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> but I did the next best thing. I married one of them. <laughs> I have one thing in common with Ziad. We both married into the same family, and we both married up. <laughs> I'm, uh, I stole this line from Bill Clinton and, and Barack Obama. They always say that they married up, and uh, you can see why. And in my case and Ziad's case, you can also see why. So uh, anyway, uh, we come to the end. All, all good things must come to an end, as they say. Uh, I will never forgive you because you've been rowdy. Uh, but now that you've eaten, you settle down. Maybe, maybe now I should tell you a few stories about the blues. But that's okay. I'll leave that to me. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a tradition, as I said before. ATAFP has been doing a great job. And as we say, the struggle continues. And tonight you've seen a great display of Palestinian humanity, Palestinian tenacity, Palestinian humor, Palestinian stubbornness. 
Palestinian faith in the future. So hope we'll see you next year. Good night.